I've been mentioning flunixin, which is banamine. Uh, this is one of the best analgesics of the NSAIDs. All right, it'll control severe musculoskeletal and severe visceral pain. Uh, commonly used to control colic pain in horses. One of the controversies for years was should you be giving flunixin to collect horses or not because it was such a good analgesic we couldn't assess how painful they were. And remember, if, I'm sure they've talked to you, if not they will, we use the, the severity of the pain in the horse to determine whether or not it's a surgical candidate or not. Can we manage this colic medically or does it need to go to surgery? And how painful they are pay, plays a big role. The more painful, the more likely they have a surgical condition rather than a medically managed. So it's such a good analgesic, there was some debate as to whether we should be, uh, not be using flunixin uh, until we were sure it was going to go one way or another. But the point is, it's very good, okay. <laughs> Eventually, it was also approved in cattle. It can be given by all routes. You're familiar with the in injectable uh, product. Uh, in, in horses, also approved by injection for cattle, but there's also an oral product for horses that works real well. Now, a lot of veterinarians, it's, it's not on there, but a lot of veterinarians don't like IM flunixin in horses. All right, they usually give it oral or IV. The reason is that there have been some cases of septic myositis following flunixin IM injection. And they don't know why, they just say either uh, the needle is carrying a few bacteria in with it, but there's something about the local tissue irritation setting up a foci, and there have been some pretty nasty clostridial myositis from Flunix and IM administration. So you can do it, and you can get away with it, but it is somewhat of a risk, and it varies by equine clinician whether or not they'll use IM flunixin. Uh, definitely they'll use uh, IV, and sometimes they'll use oral. Now, I have no experience with it, but there is a transdermal uh, uh, flunixin for cattle now. That's a, well, actually, it's proven in horses and beef cattle. There you go. So that's kind of a neat route. Um, anyone seen it used? Me either. Okay. All right. <laughs> now, um, great drug in horses and cattle. Probably, in my view, more ulcerogenic. One of the more ulcerogenic of the NSAIDs, um, particularly long-term use. I like it short-term. But I, I try to avoid it if there's any hint of a pre-existing ulcer. And the longer I go, the more concerned I get about ulceration. Now that brings us to small animals. And this last, I added this bullet to you uh, relative to treatment of endotoxemia. Um, endotoxemia is not an uncommon occurrence, especially in colic horses. And they found that Flunixin seemed especially helpful at combating the signs of endotoxemia, okay? So it was and still is relatively common when you have an endotoxic horse to use flunixin. Now, it, it's not magical. It doesn't bind and, and, and obliterate the endotoxin. It just blocks the effects of the endotoxin. And there were multiple studies showing a benefit. All right, so people started saying, well, if it works so well in the horse, we'll give it to the dog. So they give the parvo dog that's endotoxic a shot of banamine. They give the uh, coliform mastitis, cow, uh, flunixin for the endotoxemia. And it does work. There, there are two points to make here. One, it has the studies to support that benefit in endotoxin, especially in horses. But there are other less well-known studies that show nearly all the NSAIDs do the same thing, okay? So it's probably not unique to flunixin to uh, ameliorate the signs of endotoxemia. It's just the one that got all the press, so everyone is comfortable with it, 
All right. So <laughs> in uh, small animals, uh, I, I would not use it for endotoxemia. And the reason is it is really ulcerogenic in small animals. All right. Um, and also it has caused kidney failure in small animals. Remember that whole thing of prostaglandin-induced renal failure effects on GFR I talked to you about? When I was at Illinois in grad school, <coughs> they discovered that uh, pre-treating dogs that had were going in for cataract surgery, it worked great to decrease the inflammation associated with the cataract surgery. Beautiful. And they were using it, and then they started noticing a lot of these dogs are developing renal failure post-op. All right, a substantial number develop renal failure post-op. And probably what was happening was they were getting subclinical hypotension during the anesthesia, and that was enough for the flu nixon to cause ischemic injury to the kidney. So uh, before we had the COX-2 selectives for dogs, we'd say, all right, if you absolutely positively have to give flunixin in a dog, give one dose and make sure they're really well hydrated and, and observe them, but no more. Now, I don't even say that. We have too many good drugs, some safer drugs that we can use. So no, if, if, you're, you're, uh, if you go out and an older practitioner has a parvo puppy and he wants to give a shot of banamine, well, you can't tell your boss not to do it, but I wouldn't do it personally. I, if I wanted to use it, I'd give him a shot of, of Remedil or, or a Medicam or something like that. I would not use Flunixin in a, in a dog. All right, uh, a few lesser uses, ketoprofen, ketoprofen approved for use in horses, given IV or M, I am less ulcerogenic and nephrotoxic, but also not, not as good an analgesic as flunixin. So good product, uh, not quite as good a pain control, useful for, for mild to moderate visceral and somatic. You notice flunixin was good for uh, extreme uh, severe uh, visceral and somatic. Uh, approved in horses in the U.S. There's an oral form in Canada for dogs, and we have used it extra labelly for up to five days. Again, that's mainly historic now. We have the approved NSAIDs in small animals, so you won't use very much ketoprofen. Paroxicam. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the few NSAIDs besides aspirin that can be used in cats. Notice I haven't mentioned Butte, Flunixin, any of these for cats. I said aspirin early on. All right, we can use Paroxicam in cats. It's good for mi moderate to severe musculoskeletal pain. Why would you use it? It turns out to have anti-neoplastic activity against transitional cell carcinomas. This uh, is a human NSAID. All right, non-selective, and it was the anti-neoplastic action that caused them to work the dose out. It can be used in both dog and cat for TCCs. It won't cure them, but it can sometimes slow the progression of the tumor. In a few cases, some temporary regression of the tumor. All right, and this is probably because it concentrates in the urine. All your NSAIDs concentrate in urine. So you don't see this benefit with other cancers, just with transitional cell carcinomas. Now there's some debate, a lot of oncologists will add an NSAID, hoping that it uh, helps with the tumor uh, regression or slows its growth, but the only real evidence to support that is the transitional cell carcinoma. So it can be given, uh, a, a couple of things, because it's human only, it has to be compounded for the dog or cat. Not so much to change the formulation as just to weigh out the right amount. The, the pill for grandma is a whole lot more than you'd ever give your, your kitty cat. Okay, so it has to be weighed out properly. And because it's non-selective, I like to really closely monitor them. Uh, some people will say in cats you can't do it, uh, it's too toxic to take the risk. I have done it. I remember one cat that had a fibrosarcoma invading the pelvis. 
This was back when we were trying, just figuring out that certain vaccines cause fibrosarcomas in cats. And now you know your recommendations. We'll go over vaccinology in some uh, future lectures. But now when we vaccinate cats, we say to vaccinate down low on the cat's leg, not high. Because if you vaccinate low and you get a fibrosarcoma, you can amputate the leg and save the cat. If you amputate high, or excuse me, if you give it high and they get a fibrosarcoma, then you're having to do what's called a hemipelvectomy to go in and remove part of the pelvis, which is major, major surgery. And in this particular cat, it had invaded the pelvis. They weren't going to do a hemipelvectomy. So uh, I used Paroxicam um, to p control the pain for the cat for about 45 days before we had to euthanize it. So it can be done. But I like to do periodic UAs, making sure that the kidneys are OK. And I'll do periodic occult bloods, making sure and hoping that we don't have any GI ulcers and CBCs. So if I use it long, longer term, I do monitor intensively. I don't just throw it out willy-nilly um, because of the risks. All right, But unique risk, transitional cell carcinoma, and one of the few that can be used in cats. All right. Now we move into the Cox selectives. And the first one to come out on the market was carprofen, which is Remedil. It's approved as oral and injectable. Um, approved for DJD. Now, we use it for other things. Remember when a, a drug is approved, to be approved, it has to go through a clinical trial. So to go through a clinical trial, you have to have a disease that's common enough to get enough patient numbers to, to meet the statistical requirements. And what you're going to see is um, DJD, osteoarthritis, is really common in dogs. So this is the, a major indication for the NSAIDs. You'll notice that the, the one I'm going to talk about, rabinococcib in cats, is not approved for uh, over three days of use. The reason is not that it wouldn't work, it's that they can't find enough cats with arthritis to go through a clinical trial. All right, what they could find was post-op spay and neuter recovery for three days. So that's why one is approved one way and one is approved the other. But for the dogs, nearly always, they're approved for musculoskeletal pain. Can be given once or twice daily, doesn't seem to be a clear preference. Typically once a day for convenience. Uh, can be used chronically. Um, now, a single dose can be used, but it's too ulcerogenic in the cat for repeated doses. I wouldn't even use it now. We have approved Medicam uh, as a single dose in cats, so I wouldn't use carprofen anymore. Now, um, Remedil was the first COX-2 selective to come out in dogs. And you always, if you're a drug company, want to be the first out with a new type of product because you capture 90% of the market. And that's the case with Remedil, okay? They still dominate the market in terms of sales of NSAIDs, though we have a multitude of others. Now, the one drawback to that is because you sell so much, you're going to see the side effects in your product. All right. And one of the things that started showing up was hepatotoxicity, and it's a type B idiosyncratic reaction. A certain number of these dogs will develop um, liver damage and can go on to liver failure and death. All right. uh, <coughs> there was a uh, belief that Labrador retrievers were more susceptible to the hepatotoxicity. There's no data to back that up. Probably, uh, you know, labs have a lot of uh, hip dysplasia and osteoarthritis, so they get a lot of Remedil. So it may be just an overrepresentation rather than a uh, true breed predilection. But uh, a colleague of mine took, um, I forget how many dogs he recruited, 40, 50, uh, Labrador is trying to induce the hepatotoxicity, and he could not. It's again a type B idiosyncratic. So you may never see it, but if you do, it, it is a problem. Only about 0.05% of the cases develop hepatotoxicity. That's five in 10,000 dogs. But if your client is the one that has it, it's a big deal. 
All right. So one of the things that uh, we monitor for are the hepatotoxicities, and I'll talk about the controversies with that later.